Suffragettes, written by Canterbury Christchurch University's very own Leah Hockley. Yay! Yay! This is part of the Being Human Festival, which is the UK's only national festival of the humanities. It's been running for around five years now, and the idea is that once a week in November, universities and community partners up and down the UK tell everybody what the humanities is for, why we bother, why it matters. And I don't think I really need to introduce that because you're going to see a play that will show us exactly why the humanities are more relevant than ever, more important than ever, and actually more uncomfortable than ever. So I want you to imagine that it's 1918. Women now have the vote. Yeah, come on, let's give it some welling. Women now have the vote. Some women have the vote, but not all. World War I is now over. And of course, I don't need to tell you, standing here, the significance of the place where we're standing. A hundred years later, we're commemorating the end of World War I, and we're also celebrating female suffrage. So two very different things. One is very solemn. The other we tend to think of as being a real achievement, a very uncomplicated, good thing all round. But what if the suffragettes to whom we owe so much are not always lovely, nice people? What if actually we don't agree with their methods? What if we don't like their politics? What if some of the women who won us the vote were actually in favour of eugenic selection? What if they were in favour of sending 18-year-old boys out to France to die in the trenches? What happens then? I give you first of the feathers, soldiers and suffragettes. Ready? Three, two, one. 
1918. The Great War is over and the fight for female suffrage seems to be coming to an end. People are celebrating Armistice Day with shouts of joy and women are beginning to see the possibility of a life where men and women are equal. yet they seem to have forgotten. They seem to have forgotten what happened before the world as we knew it changed. They have forgotten how much we suffragettes, we women, fought for men to hear our voices. They have forgotten the men whose cowardice overcame their duty to fight for this country. They have forgotten the shame that we felt for standing up for something that we believed in. How is it fair that we should spend years fighting for what we believed in, only to be laughed at and ridiculed in front of our friends and family? All that fighting. The suffragettes weren't utilizing their most powerful weapon. So some of us took it into our own hands to fix the problem. You are the problem. <laughs> we had spent years fighting for what we believed in. So why wouldn't we use what we knew to finally get our point across? A single white feather. That's all it was. And yet we were labelled as being too forward or for using our sexual power to shame men into the army. How ridiculous. If the men who received the feather felt guilty, it wasn't because we were drawing attention to their decision not to fight. It was because they knew in their hearts that it was wrong not to join their brothers on the battlefield. The look on their faces is something I remember even now. Almost three years and a whole world war later. Some faces were filled with shame and fear knowing that they were now subject to the ridicule that we believe they so rightly deserved. And we weren't afraid about approaching them. Whether they were alone or in a group of friends, at the theater or walking down the street, we would approach them feather in hand and you could almost see the humiliation wash over them. It was like a physical being had wrapped itself around them and would never let go. It marked a stain on them, their grief doing more damage than anything that we could ever do. You can mark me because I have no shame in ending so many innocent lives for no reason. Yes, now just come back to life. Others were more resilient in the face of shame, choosing to look at us with the same disgust and amusement that others often looked at us with. And these were the harder of the two to impress upon. But that didn't mean that we didn't give them a feather. Just because they weren't affected by our feathers certainly did not mean that we were going to put an end to our efforts. It hadn't ever before, so why would it now? But that didn't stop people from laughing at us as we walked past them. Our heads held high against the whispering gossip that followed us wherever we went. To our friends, we were an embarrassment. Our husbands, 
choosing to banish us from our own homes rather than live with a suffragette wife, possible suitors turning away from the idea of marrying a woman who spoke her mind. Being a suffragette was hard enough. But being part of the white feather movement felt like a different kind of shame. We were fighting to have a place in our history, leaving our mark so that we may be remembered for fighting for equality. But what made it harder still was that some of our suffragette sisters wouldn't stand with us on this front. We were violently divided into two factions, those who opposed the war and those who blindly supported it, seeing it as some sort of opportunity. Just a year before the war broke out, Emmeline Pankhurst proudly claimed that she was a soldier who had temporarily left the field of battle in order to explain what civil war was like when civil war was waged by women. So it came as no surprise to us that she urged us to put an end to the campaign and support the war. And yet her own daughter, Sylvia Pankhurst, ardently opposed supporting the war. And it was interesting seeing how many women turned away from supporting the war after everything that we had done over the past 11 years. The idea of such violence seemed too much for them. And yet we had spent over a decade choosing to disrupt Parliament, attack politicians, chain ourselves to railings, burn down churches and set post boxes on fire. And if that wasn't enough, dear Emily Davison threw herself in front of the King's horse at the Derby race. Was someone giving their life for what they believed in acceptable? And yet choosing to support the war wasn't. How could we not simply use both to our advantage? After all, after everything that we had done, pinning small white feathers onto gentlemen's clothing hardly seemed like a big deal. Our movement had always been radical, believing that social disobedience was the only way that our voices were going to be heard. And we suffragettes did nothing by half measures, otherwise we simply wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So why couldn't we continue in solidarity throughout a war that was going to happen, whether or not we agreed with it or not? But what were we to do? The more that we pushed that what we were doing was right, the further away we pushed those who disagreed with us. And we found ourselves with a sisterhood broken in two. It was inevitable that such a large group of people would, wouldn't see eye to eye on everything. And the White Feather Movement was a perfect example of this. But that wasn't the only thing that divided us. 1883 saw the arrival of eugenics. And it was widely talked about by society and suffragettes alike. Francis Galton's expansion of Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest, was devoured by a country who were obsessed with industrialization and empire. Superior human genetics and the insurance of the survival and development of society's fittest provided evidence and justification for the things British people loved. Suddenly, colonization, the class system, and the belief that women were objects for reproductive purposes had scientific support. And Galton 
firmly believed that women were completely inferior to men, naming us breeders who were practically useless for anything other than reproduction. This was not only ignorant, but it was just plain offensive. We are people capable of our own thoughts, feelings and beliefs, not some useless objects that need to be told what to do, when to do it and how to do it. But Galton's theory emphasised what people had believed for centuries, that women should be monitored and looked after, incapable of functioning on their own. Again, we found a shift in our mood. And eugenics found a home for women's beliefs on motherhood, eugenics, and society. Having another shift in our movement emphasized the feeling of loss and despair that we had felt before losing some of our suffragette sisters from our sides. And I wasn't the only one who was angered by their decision. Not only was eugenics wrong and offensive, but it reminded us of how it feels to be shunned for believing in something that the majority don't. And that's why the White Feather Movement was so important to me. Because we were showing those who had stood against us what it feels like to be shamed for believing in something that other people don't. We suffragettes were monumental in developing women's rights. And we fought as hard as we could to do as much as we could. And sure, our actions weren't always right. We weren't always the heroes that you wanted us to be. But that didn't mean that the outcome wasn't positive. Keep in line. We didn't want to be the villains of this story. But we couldn't stay silent any longer. innocent lives. I watched many of my friends die out there, but I kept going. Because this country needs us. We are the strong men, and you are not. You are cowards. Weakling scum. Rightly so. Yeah, but it's not my mum. I wasn't allowed to go out, because my dad died out there. So, so you're a mummy's boy. Alright. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So what? My dad was a soldier too. And his dad before him. And probably his dad before him. Probably tradition. Yes. That's why he goes to him. You go kill people. In my country, it's the Russian revolution. You have to live in no war. So loyal. It's because they are. By killing. 
Yes. So many people. That's what it takes. Imagine, really? imagine seeing your friends die in front of your hand. Imagine feeling people fall to your arms knowing you can't save them. That makes you brave. You call yourself brave? You haven't seen anything. No, that would happen if you could fight. It's not as simple as that, boy. You have to fight. Sometimes there's war and you have to do your part. You can't you just not. Imagine the parents of the people you've killed. How would they feel? If they didn't fight, who would? You? You wouldn't fight. You wouldn't lay your hand on a gun. You cannot touch a gun. That's my belief. Belief? Sort of. I've heard of the Crusades. I've never done anything of What people would kill? Back for that, have you? Slice of change. You have no respect for us. You have no respect for us. Or for the women who deserve it. You don't deserve respect. What about the woman who's preaching her mind? Talk to her speech. What do you think? What do you think? What would you think? I don't know about anybody else, but I think I think that's incredibly uncomfortable. Um yeah, I'm I think it's about this. I I am, I'm afraid, going to have to ask you what you think through the customary evaluation form because it is a condition of our funding and it also makes it possible for this festival to run in subsequent years. Um, could we just once again, before we have a Q&A with our historian Dr Martin Watts who advised on the play, many, many thanks again to Georgie, our suffragette from Hanley Theatre. and non-combatants from Harvey Grammar School, Folkestone. And we are absolutely is actually an undergraduate student at Canterbury Christ Church University. And this is, I believe, your first play to be performed in public. And I, for one, hope it won't be the last. Thank you so much for working with us. Thank you. Martin is available to answer questions, largely because he's the only one with the historical knowledge to answer <laughs> with any degree of accuracy.